If you're a fan of Greek mythology, then you know Perseus. You know, Perseus. The guy who ran around with winged boots and a cap, wielding a sickle-shaped sword. You know, the guy who killed Medusa, the scary snake lady who could turn people to stone just by staring at them, and then rescued a hot babe immediately after. Yeah, well, did you know in the second half of his life, he basically just bopped around the ancient world with Medusa's head in a bag, using it to turn whoever he didn't like into stone? Or that he killed his own grandfather with a frisbee and was conceived via golden shower? Don't worry, kids. You can't really get pregnant that way, but you can by kissing so choose wisely. Perseus was a massively important character and symbol in ancient Greece. There's not really a historical time we think Perseus existed, just in a mythical before time that resembles Bronze Age Greece three-ish thousand years ago. We know Perseus' story because it was written down by Greek and later Roman writers, but like most myths, the story definitely existed before it was written down. It's important to clarify that stories evolve differently as they're passed between kingdoms and cultures, so there is no single definitive version of the life of Perseus. There are definitely variants that are more popular and well-known nowadays, but you'll see that different sources incorporate different tales and details and sometimes even contradict each other. I want to cover as many as possible today, but I'll make it clear when we're branching off the main timeline and when we return to it. But before we dive into the subject of heroes, I want to tell you about my hero, today's sponsor, Aura. Did you know that all someone has to do to find your private information is search your name on Google? It's terrifying, but it's true. Your phone number, your home address, your email addresses, and even a list of your relatives are just sitting on these random sites waiting for someone to buy that info and sign you up for spam or scams. I found this out a few years ago when a friend Googled my name and proceeded to read me personal details that I never dreamed would be so easily available online, but it wasn't until recently that I learned of a solution. I've been using today's sponsor, Aura, to find these data brokers selling my information and automatically submit opt-out requests for me. It's been a huge help in reducing the spam I get, but it also protects me from hackers who could use this information to access my social media accounts, bank accounts, and other sensitive info. Not only that, they also have other features to protect me and family from invisible online threats. There's antivirus, VPN password management, and identity theft insurance. You may already have one or two of these tools already, but setting up Aura is really simple because these tools can all be found in one app and they have one affordable price. So you can either let people continue to exploit and profit off your private information, or you could go to aura.com slash John Solo to start your two week trial. That link is in the description below so you can get started right away. Now the best sources for Tales of Perseus are a 2nd century CE Greek book called the Bibliotheca of Pseudo Apollodorus and the writings of Ovid, a Roman poet who lived between 100 BCE and 100 CE. These days you might know Perseus from pop culture, whether it's him being referenced in books and series like Percy Jackson or full on depicted in movies like Clash of the Titans. Whether you prefer the hammed up 1981 version or the muddy 2000 screamo energy of 2010's Clash of the Titans, or the sequel, Wrath of the Titans, where Sam Worthington has longer hair to show that time has passed. It probably won't surprise you to hear that these movies aren't very faithful adaptations. They're more like mythology remixes that incorporate some parts of Perseus' story. For one thing, both versions end with Perseus battling the Kraken, who doesn't actually exist in Greek mythology, and in the 2010 version, his grandfather is turned into some kind of werewolf demon. To be fair, there is a myth about Zeus turning a Greek king into a werewolf, but it was Lycaon, not Acrisius. Some of you might be familiar with Perseus because you beat the hero senseless in God of War 2 another non-canon event. Anyway, if you're looking for a more faithful telling of Perseus' story, the Perseus and the Gorgon episode of Jim Henson's TV show The Storyteller does a shockingly good job considering the frame story they give it is a guy talking to his dog. But I shouldn't judge, I do the same thing with Gunther and Penny. Now the story that ancient Greeks and Romans would have known starts with Perseus' grandfather, Acrisius. Acrisius had the great luck of being king of a city called Argos and having an absolute dime of a daughter named Danae. But he was worried about not having a male heir to his kingdom. And boy, are kings willing to stir shit 
up when they want a male heir. You see, Acrisius stopped by the famous Oracle of Delphi, as one does, to see if he had any masculinity in his loins. But in typical Oracle fashion, she did not have the news Acrisius was looking for. In fact, she told him it was his daughter who would have a son, and that son would grow up to murder him and take his kingdom. Now keep in mind, this was no storefront psychic giving out $5 palm readings. This Oracle had a reputation for accurate predictions and she put the fear of the gods into Acrisius, who sought to solve his problem by locking his daughter in an underground chamber to make sure that she couldn't get pregnant. You thought chastity belts were bad, try a chastity chamber. Seriously, try it. This latest generation is out of control. Now there is obviously a lot wrong with Acrisius' solution, but the main logistical problem is that this is mythic ancient Greece, and the main god around is Zeus, who took his wife's watchful eye as a personal challenge and made a habit of transforming into stuff and getting women pregnant. There are multiple occasions where Zeus saw some pretty young thing, transformed himself into a swan or a snake or a goddamn bull to hook up with her, she was down with it, and a hero was born. But to get to Danae, locked up, up underground, Zeus had to get really creative and, according to texts, turned himself into a shower of gold or golden shower. What does that mean? Well, I've personally always imagined it as rays of sunlight because it's mentioned that she has some openings in the ceiling of her cell to allow light in, but the texts don't go into detail beyond a stream of gold and shower of gold. So I guess it could technically mean what we're all hoping it doesn't mean. Well, all of us but Derek, but that guy's a creep. And I don't know why he still watches my content. One way or another, Zeus's golden shower got Danae pregnant, and she delivered a little boy she named Perseus. It's never specified how long mother and son spent in their prison, but when her father, King Acrisius, learned of his new grandson, he was so overjoyed that he shoved mother and child into a chest, locked it, and chucked it into the sea. Acrisius and his flawless fixes. Somehow the Immaculate Conception wasn't enough to convince him that the fates will always find a way. Because this might have worked had the baby not belonged to the Lord of all gods, but he did. So Zeus convinced Poseidon to calm the ocean waves, and the chest gently drifted to an island called Seraphos, where a fisherman found it and broke it open. The fisherman, named Dictus, brought Danae and Perseus to the king of Seraphos, a guy called Polydectes. And depending on the version, King Polydectes had an interesting relationship with Danae and Perseus. Some traditions state that he and Danae were in a consensual romance and he raised Perseus like a son, but the most commonly told version claims he made Danae his slave and she rejected him every time he made a pass at her. Assuming that this was because of her loyalty to her son and his father, whoever he was, the king got jealous and sought to take Danae all for himself by sending Perseus on a suicide mission. Which, since this is Greek mythology, you already know entails killing a monster in the middle of nowhere. Before we dive into Perseus' trip though, I want to invite you on a little trip to Greece with me and a few dozen other members of our community. For real, this is not a bit. Thanks to our partners at Trova Trip, me and 24 of you will spend a week exploring Athens, tasting authentic Nemean wine, touring ancient sites like the Theater of Epidurus, sea kayaking, and a lot more, all with our own personal tour guide. The trip is scheduled for September 7th to September 13th of this year, will cost $3,800, and that price includes all of your hotel stays and every activity scheduled for that week. For those who want to learn more, I recommend you check out the trip page or watch my video where I answer some of the most commonly asked questions. Links to both of those are in the description. But if you don't want to miss out on this amazing opportunity to tour Greece with a community of people just as obsessed with mythology and history as you are, I'd recommend you reserve your spot fast. Right now, there are only 14 spots left, and if it's anything like our Ireland trip, they're gonna fill up fast. I hope to see you there. So in order to get some alone time with his hot mom, Perseus is sent by King Polydectes to collect the head of a creature called Medusa. This is by far the most famous chapter in Perseus' story and one of the most famous Greek myths of all time. Medusa was one of three Gorgon sisters. The other two were named Stheno and Eurali. According to the Bibliotheca of Pseudo Apollodorus, the Gorgons all had big hog tusks, bronze claws, and golden wings. Other writers describe them as having 
having vibrating tongues and with bodies wrapped in serpents. Medusa was particularly fearsome though, because she had snakes for hair, and if you looked her in the eyes, you would turn to stone, which made killing her very tricky. Thankfully, since Perseus was Zeus's Nepo baby, that meant his phone of friends were his half-sister Athena and half-brother Hermes, the wise goddess of battle strategy and the messenger god of trickery. In some variants, Athena and Hermes just give Perseus all the gear he needs for his battle with Medusa, but in the pseudo-Apollodorus version, they sent their half-brother on a bunch of side quests to retrieve it. First, he had to find the Gree, some of the divine but decrepit sisters of the Gorgons, who apparently only had one tooth and one eyeball to share between all of them. The Gree also happened to know where some divine daughters called the Nymphi were, but wouldn't dish out this crucial intel, so Perseus stole their one tooth and one eyeball and made them tell him. And I've gotta give credit to Clash of the Titans for accurately showing this exchange. Kinda of up to steal some old lady's only method of seeing and chewing food. That's like going into a nursing home and hiding all the bifocals and dentures. But sometimes you just gotta do f***ed up things to fulfill your destiny. Just ask Darth Vader. When Perseus found the Nymphi, they gave him winged sandals to fly with, a helmet that made him invisible, and a nice handbag called a cabissus. His half-siblings also gave him some gear. Hermes, a crescent-shaped sickle, and Athena, a reflective shield that doubled as a mirror. Based on what he did to the Gree, I really want to know what he did to the Nymphi to make them give up all that sweet loot, but this part gets a little rushed. This is basically the Q scene in a Bond movie, so maybe the Nymphi just do it for the love of designing, manufacturing, and distributing murder toys. So Perseus used his new winged feet to fly to Medusa's lair in Libya, and as luck, or the fates, would have it, when he arrived, the Gorgon sisters were sleeping. It turns out even hideous monsters need beauty rest. Since Perseus can't look at Medusa without turning to stone, he walks backwards, using the reflection in the polished shield to see where he's going and avoid stumbling on the petrified remains of previous visitors. When he could finally see Medusa's face in the reflection on his shield, he swung his sword back and in one fell swoop, chopped her head off at the neck. Then, Perseus stuffed Medusa's head in his satchel and got the hell out of there on his winged feet. When you think about it, Medusa's death was kind of anticlimactic. The tension does get raised a bit when Perseus has to run for dear life after her sisters see what he's done, but the actual execution was over before you could say, that gore gun is gore gone. Boo this man! Meanwhile, the pop culture versions usually give us an awake Medusa for added excitement. The 1981 version makes it a bit more of an action scene and gives Perseus a buddy so we can watch him get turned to stone. And the 2010 version blows the kill count way up. Meanwhile, the storyteller version makes it kind of feel like Perseus is parallel parking in traffic. Why don't you look at me? I like to be looked at. A detail that rarely gets mentioned in pop culture, though, is that the death of Medusa allowed for new life to spring forth. Her two sons with Poseidon, Pegasus, the winged horse, and the human-looking Chrysaor, burst out of her neck stump. In myth, Perseus doesn't have any meaningful interactions with either of them, but both versions of Clash of the Titans show him taming Pegasus and flying his new noble steed to save Andromeda just before she's devoured by the Kraken. In actual myth, Perseus does toss Medusa's head in a bag, then flies off to save the day somewhere else, but he uses his winged sandals and not a flying horse. Now it's at this point that Perseus' situation really changes. Before, he was an underdog, but now he's got a new weapon in the form of Medusa's head, and the gaze of her dead, empty eyes can still turn anyone who makes eye contact to stone. This is pretty cool even now, but it's really cool in the Bronze Age. There was no gunpowder, no guns, no bombs, no cannons. Most fighting in those days was very close and very dangerous. Now here was a guy who could just pull a head out of a bag and kill you at a distance with low or no effort. In other words, Perseus was bringing a ray gun to all of his knife fights. So while Perseus was snagging this OP weapon, a tense situation was brewing in Ethiopia with a princess called Andromeda. Andromeda's mom, Cassiopeia, the queen of Ethiopia, had apparently been boasting to some sea nymphs called the Nereids about how her daughter was more beautiful than any god or divine being in the universe, 
and the Nereids didn't appreciate that. Which I kind of get. I mean, if you started telling me about your cousin's great YouTube channel, I'd be like, that's awesome. I'm glad for your cousin. I'll check it out sometime. But if you went on ranting about his amazing content and said it was way better than mine, I'd probably want to send a sea monster to devour your cousin alive. I realize that makes me sound petty, but unfortunately the Nereids felt the same way, while also having the power to do something about it thanks to the relationship with Poseidon the god of the sea. According to Pseudo Apollodorus, the Nereids were in a rage, and Poseidon, in sympathetic anger, sent a flood tide upon the land and a sea monster as well. Part of me wonders if Poseidon was really sympathetic, or if he was just sick of his wife's friends complaining. I've got to imagine that sounded like the real housewives of ancient Greece. How do you know what's good for me? That's my opinion! Either way, this was not ideal for Ethiopia, so the king popped in to see the local oracle, and she prophesied that if the king gave his daughter to the horrible sea monster as a meal, all the trouble would stop. And apparently, Cepheus saw no reason to doubt this, because he ordered Andromeda be chained to the coastal rocks as bait. Very lucky for Andromeda, Perseus happened to be flying over. It's not really clear why Perseus was flying over Ethiopia, because it wasn't exactly along his route from Libya back to Seraphos, but sources differ on where Perseus actually found the Gorgons, so maybe that has something to do with it. Or your boy was feeling like the king of the world after slaughtering a thought to be a more she-demon and wanted to take those winged sandals out for a joyride to celebrate. It's not really our business, to be honest, but according to Ovid, Perseus spotted Andromeda tied up and was instantly smitten and gained a fetish for bondage. Then he quickly killed the sea monster, threatening his new true love, and brought Andromeda back to the king and insisted she be allowed to marry him. In the Clash movies, the sea monster is the so-called Kraken, and Perseus uses Medusa's head to kill the thing. But the classical texts aren't all in agreement on Perseus's methods. Using Medusa's head would certainly make the most sense, but in some versions he uses the same crescent-shaped sword that he killed Medusa with. Which is surprising, considering how often he uses the head on people he just doesn't like in these next few myths. Perseus stuck around Ethiopia for a bit to do the whole wedding thing, and this was great for Andromeda, because now she didn't have to marry her uncle. That's right, Andromeda had already been engaged to her uncle, which at that time was common in ruling classes in that part of the world. And super gross. Andromeda's uncle was pissed about losing out on the sweetest loot the gods ever made and plotted to kill Perseus at the wedding. But Perseus caught wind of this and gave Andromeda's uncle and all his co-conspirators a little peek at Medusa's head. With the sea monster dead and Andromeda's uncle turned to stone, she and Perseus were free to get hitched and live happily ever after and she wouldn't have to get eaten or do incest. The next thing Perseus did on his journey was run into the Titan called Atlas. In Greek mythology, the Titans were an earlier generation of giant gods who at this point had been replaced by Zeus and the Olympians. They were actually Zeus's aunts and uncles and cousins. The Titans had been overthrown by Zeus and the Olympians in a decade-long war called the Titanomachy, and when the Olympians won, they sentenced Atlas to hold up the sky, or heaven, on his shoulders forever. Typically, that's how Atlas is presented, a huge guy holding up the heavens, or the earth for some reason. But the Ovid version also presents him as kind of the king of the local area where he's standing, with a walled garden protected by a dragon, somehow still holding up the sky. In Ovid's version, Perseus needs a place to rest after flying so hard and asks Atlas if he could help him out but he should have been more careful with his word choice. According to Ovid, Perseus offered to tell Atlas the story of a noble race and mentioned the author of my story is Jupiter, which was what the Romans called Zeus. This was not such a great sell. Atlas's life sucked because of Zeus and his children, and now he knew Perseus was one of them. So Atlas said, be gone. And then Perseus said, ya mother and used Medusa's head to turn him to stone. Actually, believe it or not, Perseus tried to wrestle Atlas into submission first. Not sure why he thought that would be a good idea, but when the Titan was easily able to overpower him, Perseus busted out the Medusa head as a failsafe. That's some cold-hearted 
although some versions present this as Perseus being merciful in relieving Atlas of his burdens. But life is suffering for everyone, and while Atlas's burden was a major one, he was clearly living it up in every other way. So I think those merciful interpretations are Perseus propaganda. Regardless, the giant stone Atlas would go on to become a mountain range. I'm not sure how though. Erosion, probably? Ovid writes, His great beard and hair are forests, and his shoulders and his hands mountainous ridges, and his head the top of a high peak. So this Perseus side quest is the Greco-Roman origin story for the Atlas Mountains, which are in what's now Northern Africa. So after getting hitched in Ethiopia and then straight up murdering Atlas for no reason, Perseus finally returned to Greece to wrap up some loose ends from the beginning of his story. In some versions, Perseus returns to Seraphos, the island where he was raised, to save his mother from a violent and abusive King Polydectes. Polydectes had assumed Perseus would die on the Medusa mission and never expected him to bring something back. And you can guess what happens to Polydectes. Perseus presented his prize from killing Medusa, and her piercing gaze turned him to stone. I swear, I'm starting to feel like Bilbo telling stories here. And turn them all to stone! <laughs> so now having rescued his mother and his lover, two separate people, Perseus relinquishes Medusa's head to Athena and then returns the gear she and Ermes lent him. Then he brings Andromeda and Danae to Argos, where he was born. He wanted to get a good look at his grandfather, Acrisius, who, need I remind you, tried to drown Perseus when he was an innocent little baby. And when Acrisius gets word that Perseus is returning, he ditches his throne to go on the run. Perseus, with nothing to do since his grandfather disappeared, ends up participating in the funeral games honoring the life of King Polydectes. Which is ironic since he took the life of King Polydectes. This wasn't quite as exciting as slaying monsters and men, but at least this time he'd have an audience to witness his greatness, right? Well, by total coincidence, Acrisius, with nothing better to do since he's trying to avoid Perseus, ends up attending those funeral games and so he's a member of that audience. Perseus participates in the discus throwing competition, but I guess his aim is as bad as his navigation. So the disc flies into the crowd and cracks an old man in the head, sending him falling to the ground, dead. That old man was Perseus's grandfather. After getting over the death of dear old grandpa, Perseus has one of the rare few happy endings of Greek heroes. He inherits his grandfather's kingdom, thereby fulfilling the oracle's prophecy, goes on to have kids, founds multiple dynasties, and he actually ends up being the great-grandfather of Heracles. But in one of the most twisted family trees of all time, he's also Heracles' half-brother because they were both sired by Zeus. That's typical Greek myth for you though. I mean, this isn't even the first time I've referenced this exact family tree. It also comes up in my video on Heracles' twin brother, Iphicles, which you can watch by hitting the link that pops up at the end of this episode. Before I wrap up though, I wanna mention the lone sad ending of Perseus' story which could be found in pseudo fabulae. In this telling, Perseus learned that his great uncle Proetus, Acrisius' brother, had taken over Acrisius' kingdom when he went into hiding to escape Perseus. And Perseus thought that was a dick move, so he killed Proetus and took the kingdom for himself. Then, years later, Perseus was revenge killed by Proetus' son, Megapenthes, his cousin. Like I said, this is the only account of Perseus' death by Megapenthes, so it's possible this was a fringe version that just so happened to be written down and survived, but I wanted to mention it. There's no denying it's still a more honorable death than what Kratos gave him. Regardless of the ending, we can all learn from Perseus' story. Firstly, it should be clear that oracles are not to be visited, unless you want to die an ironic death, which is the worst kind of death. Secondly, you can look at it as inspiration. The next time you run into a King Polydectes and are challenged to do something difficult or near impossible, accept that challenge and show them what you're capable of. Who knows, maybe you'll end up discovering something about yourself along the way. Or you'll find an insta-kill death ray and everything will be easy from there on out. Sounds like a happy ending to me, but let me know your thoughts on Perseus' story in a comment down below, and then by sacrificing those like and subscribe buttons to the algorithm gods. I know it's a lot to ask, but they'll bless you with more messed up mythology in your sub box and recommended feed. 
so it's worth it. I'll see you all again next week when we dive into one of the weirdest stories in the entire Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark series. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first. Thank you.